He was my pastor all my life. Many of you had met him. And uh, he was a dairy farmer that received a call to minister uh, later in life. And he accepted that call and became the pastor of uh, Derek Manson. Uh, he's the only one I ever knew uh, to be the pastor. And um, so some of the things that he did, I probably do today because of the things that he did. A lot of us do things that we've seen other people do. That's why we do them. We've watched them, we've got that work, we like the personality, we like what that was said. So we have mimicked uh, some of the things that they've done. Brother Paul uh, was my pastor. My senior year in high school, um, he decided that we ought to try uh, fasting and praying uh, during the school year. And so uh, my high school is just was just two blocks before uh, by the church, Fort Burke. And uh, so my senior year, I uh, kept thinking about it, and I thought, you know, I think I'll join them. I'm going to go down there and walk down there as a high school senior and go fast with the moment so I missed my lunch, walked down there, prayed with all the old people at the church. Now looking back, I'm sure that they were thrilled that there was a young kid, any kid, you know, showing up. And every once in a while they would uh, talk me into praying, and I'm sure that probably thrilled them even more. Because if I was in the opposite shoes today, I'd be going, so that so-and-so's coming. You know. So it was, it was probably a spark for them. But, but what, what happened out of that was, when we uh, got towards this time frame that he wanted us to be doing this in, all of a sudden, uh, three families showed up at church. Three brand new families. And um, so, um, see you, Brandon. And so it was a quite an experience uh, for me to, to, to watch that. And so I made a switch in my head and I said, uh, fasting the brain, new people. And, and I've stuck it in my head. If I can fast and pray and I ask God for new people, through things. And so in my life, because of that, um, I fast and pray uh, at least once a week, and, if not more, uh, and do that on a regular basis. So because of him, uh, that has invaded into my life. So that um, a few years ago, when we had our train wreck at the church and uh, things were a disaster and I didn't feel like I had anything to offer you uh, during that time period. It's just uh, uh, how low can you go type thing. It was that, in that time frame, God, I felt like God was uh, speaking to me about uh, some potentials and so involved in that, I got to thinking about it and um, John Pritchard and I were, were talking one day and I had already felt this way and so I, I was talking to John I said, John, uh, you know, what would you think about if we were to get together once every, I don't know, every so many weeks and uh, just if I can help you out, you know, I will. See, I didn't even know what to say. I mean, it was such a different thing for me. And so we got, got to meeting and uh, it was an interesting process for me. Well, in the meantime of all that, I had already been meeting with a, a guy. Uh, we've met for several years now, and uh, pastor at uh, Topeka, one of it, who used to be on our district, L.D. Holmes. L.D. Uh, does not um, flower me with any pretty words. He looks straight at me, calls it what it is. If I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, uh, he just whacks at me. <laughs> when I'm going through all of this, and I come in with my head down, tucked between my, you know, my tail tucked between my, just, just I don't want to look at anybody. Man, he would just be on me uh, every time that I would meet with him. And so it was in that process that John and I began to meet. I'm meeting with LD. He straightened me out. I'm trying to help John just a little bit. And uh, and I began to go through this whole process of, do I have anything to offer anybody uh, for any purpose? So in that story frame, is I want to give you some quick helps, and um, hopefully we can uh, help, help all of us out. Number one is that no matter how your church is going, good or bad, we all need a mentor. I think most of us think that we only need mentors when we are in a, in a law. But the reality is we need somebody all the time that's keeping us going. When I was going through all this, um, I learned, uh, Jim Collins had put out a book, 
a little addendum to a book, actually. And uh, in it, it said that for most churches, when they reach their pinnacle of their numbers, that their, that their problem, or in business, their problem, most of us think that the problem started just before it hit the hump. Uh, in his theory, it started three years before the peak. That's when your problem started. And so when I looked at mine, uh, in reality, he nailed us right almost to the year, almost to the month uh, on our deal. And so I realized that had I had somebody talking to me when I was going through that, if I would have really been honest with him, I probably would have solved my problem before I got to it. And so um, I wish I would have had one going full speed back then. Probably would have helped me out. Okay? So no matter how your church is going, good or bad, we all need a mentor who can help you out with any goods and bads. Number two, we believe it or not, we believe, I'm sorry, believe it or not, someone is probably doing the same thing you're doing, but they're doing it better. What tends to think that what I'm doing is the best that it can be done? Whatever you want to When we get together like this, and we're thinking, you know, I'm doing something, and boy, we're really knocking it out, and then somebody across the room says a story, and you're going, well, that's what I'm doing, but they're doing it a whole lot better than I'm doing. Okay? In mentoring, when we get together with pastors, that has a tendency to show up. And so... Uh, just just know that probably somebody's probably doing it a little bit better than you are, and if you can talk with them, you can tweak, tweak that out. Number three, for the most part, you will need to pose the question. Uh, I was when, I, when Mark was talking, I was actually I'm back to thinking full speed, and I thought of this group, but, and um, and I thought for all of us, and I'll explain to you my groups here in just a minute. But I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if just just today, if something would ignite in your heart, and in the next few months, you would create some kind of a mentorship group, not only in your church, and, and I know Mark has his teaching group, and he's doing that, and that but I'm thinking, you know, other pastors getting together, where we are not critiquing, we're not feeling like we are critiquing each other, it's not, we're not in competition. We're just here to say, can I help you out? Can I pray for you? You know, what are you, what are you going through? What are some tough things to do? So, for the most part, you're going to, you're going to have to pose the question. You're going to be the one that's going to go to somebody to say, you know, I've been thinking about this, and I'm wondering, would you like to join me? I'm going to meet at McDonald's um, Tuesday at, for lunch. Or, would you want to join me? And we can just talk about ministry and life. See how it goes? And so uh, you, you'll have to be the one to pose that question if that's going to happen. Uh, the, the person probably underneath you, uh, you know, of all of you, are, we're all here because we're pastoring churches of 200 or whatever, and the guy underneath you is probably going to be a little bit nervous about asking you. Um, okay, number four, never ever abuse your mentor's time. Hard to believe, but they are probably busier than you are. So, really applies to <clears throat> all of you, me included, should have a mentor. You all should have somebody like LD who doesn't tolerate um, my sulking and my bad attitude and my depression <laughs> that I was going through. He just didn't put up with it. We get together, and, you know, <laughs> finally when we started coming through some of this year lately, Said, man, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> that sucked. <laughs> I'm thinking, you think it was bad. <laughs> you know, but, you know, he's pushing behind me, and I know that he was praying for me. And so, uh, what I would say to you is never abuse his time. In other words, be on time. Remember that um, if you have somebody that has a bigger church than you do, that he's as busy as you are, if not busier. And so, don't make him wait for you. You'd be ahead of him, you'd be waiting on him. And uh, be a blessing to him even when he gets there because he's there to be a blessing to you. Number five, <clears throat> never be trained. Never be afraid to ask the questions, especially the ones you can't talk about to anyone in your church. Um, th these are the questions that, that Ellie and I talk about that um, I, do, I do not talk to my board about. Um, I ask him, how do I handle this? How, what, what's his staff, what's his staff, what's the deal? He talks, at this point now in our relationship, he's now talking to me about things going on in his church, and I'm starting to input on the same. 
I don't know why I do that. Uh, you know, Elliot is very brazen. Uh, he doesn't mind starting a ministry. Let's let's put nineteen thousand dollars into this. Let's give it a go. <clears throat> if it doesn't work, he just says, "Up, oh, we're done." And you know, if thirty people are mad, they'll get over. That's how he looks at it. And so, uh, I can ask him questions. One of my benefits is that I have Dustin. Dustin and I, we have made our uh, one of the calls for years. And uh, so he and I, I don't know how he feels about it. Um, I, I feel like we can ask anything of each other and probably not a whole lot hidden in our lives, uh, or in my life at least, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that he hasn't done. Number six, it's okay for him to ask the hard questions. Probably no one else is going to ask. I need somebody probably every once in a while to look me in the eye and to ask questions. Um, the Hispanics were, I was totally amazed at the Hispanics on this topic. Uh, man, they were asking question after question. I spent like 40 minutes just on questions over there. They really is. And this is one of the questions they were, they got into. Is, it's okay for him to ask hard questions because no one else is going to. Who's going to ask you how's the devotion still? Mm -hmm. I mean, who in your church walks up to you and says, How's the devotions going this week? Mm -hmm. I know you don't have anybody doing that. You know, I need to be able to look at my guys to say, how was the devotions? And they look at me and go, you know, here in a second I'll talk about these groups, but on my my guys that I have in my church, I ask those questions. They know that question is coming. So they don't duck it anymore. Now they may put their head down, but they don't duck it. And so we talk about, well, what are we going to do about that? So I, that's my second question because if it's bad, what, what can you do about that? And they usually have the solution. They already know the solution because they know it's coming. So quit the accountability, ask the question, have the hard question, nobody else is going to answer. And number seven, <clears throat> when you are with your mentor, when you're with your group, make sure you tell them things. Okay? Make sure you tell them that they have sacrificed to be there with you, <clears throat> they don't have to be there. They have a few things going on in their life, probably a bigger church, and so they don't have to be there, but they have decided to invest into your life that you have enough value in the kingdom that they want to throw their life into you. And so tell them things, all right? Now, let me see if I can make an application to this and tell you what, what I'm actually doing uh, with some of the stuff we just said. Number one is, uh, it is this is my original, uh, wait till number like six. I have a mentor, his name's L.B. Holmes. We've been together for quite a few years, and we meet, he, L.B. and I meet once a month. He is um, in Topeka. I drive halfway, he drives halfway, and we meet together. And uh, that's where we, we do hour, hour and a half. And uh, usually we don't. We talk about the weather for about 30 seconds. <clears throat> we get pretty into the conversation, how you doing, how the church going, what are you doing. And so he immediately starts asking me questions. Number two, <coughs> I have Dustin that I call. So I have uh, Dustin is every week, if not more than once a week. That will be once a month. And then I, <coughs> I started when I was in this bottom of this pit, and I was really struggling. I felt like God was asking me to, to do something with a couple, uh, one of the guys. And so John Pritcher and I were in a conversation. And so John and I began to meet, <coughs> and we meet. Oh, and we were meeting once every six weeks. Okay, that's what works for us, for me. <clears throat> so I was meeting with John. I mean, we were, we were, it was amazing what we were working through together. He had some things going on in his church. And, and since I have already been there and I've already done that, it was easy for me to say, oh, this is what's going to happen, and this is what you do. And, and he was just, he would walk out of those meetings, and, and he'd come in here, and he'd walk out like this because he had the solution to the problem. And when he went home to his church, he would do it. And he'd win. And so he'd call me and say, man, that worked. I said, well, that's what I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, go right. So, um, so I started meeting with him. And then uh, to that group, I added uh, Scott uh, Moore. Uh, Scott Moore joined in that group. And then uh, Darren Baldwin uh, joined in. And uh, that group... Uh, meets in Fort Scott, and we're getting ready to add another member to that group here this uh, next uh, few weeks. Then uh, I'll be in the second group in Chanute, and that's with Ron Sluder, and then it was BJ Woods, and uh, then Darren and Brian Davis, and we have 
just added our next member, Darren is asking, right? So Darren's already invited our next member. So that group uh, is continuing. So we meet every six weeks, and so I rotate all that, okay? Every six weeks, no, I don't do it the same week. <clears throat> one, one meets on a Friday, one meets on a Monday. And uh, we <clears throat> sit down and share life. And uh, the, the, the problem, the only problem that I see with the, the, that size group is uh, you, get, you get good variety of conversation. But um, as the group grows a little bit, we, you're limited in the amount of talk to get. And so, um, now what, what's important for that is, and if you do this, which I hope you will, you need to watch their faces and their eyes as you talk, okay? There'll be times that they're telling you, <clears throat> as soon as everybody leaves, I'm coming back in, or I'll meet you in the parking lot. They're, they're saying that with their eyes. And so, I've got a couple guys that, um, a couple of times here recently, they have, I've read their eyes and I've just got really slow about leaving. And sure enough, after everybody left the parking lot, they said, you know, I'm going to wait a minute. And it's not a long conversation because they already know what they want to say to me. And so, um, and I don't, <clears throat> I guess I picked up from LD, is if you ask me the question, man up to take the answer. So I don't fire my answers. They're not pretty. That's what you need to do. If you if you need to apologize, then you're going to apologize. Uh, you know, if your if your wife is missing your time, I was working with one of the guys and he was putting ridiculous amount of hours into the life of the church. And I said, Are you married? Well, yeah. You know, yeah. You know what he want, what he wanted to say was, Yeah, stupid. <laughs> yeah. I said, Really? Well, where is she in the priority of your list? Because apparently she is not number one, and she's not number two, and she's not three. So you tell me where she's at. Well, what are we going to do? I don't know. Well, I said, what are we going to do? Well, I guess we're going to move her up. That's good. Thank you very much. See, I, I let him do the answer. He did that. You had his own headlock. But <laughs> 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 But next, I've been the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's my that's my pastoral group. Then out of that, I said, if I'm going to meet with my pastors, I really ought to throw time into my church. Okay. So uh, now this group is not. Uh, Mark has. Um, I'm going to use all state for Mark's group. So Mark has his group of pastors that he's spending time with. Okay. This is not a group of pastors that I have. I have people who are licensed, working on the license and all that stuff. This is not that group. This is different. And what, as I begin to pray about it, God said, I want you to throw your life into the young men of your church. So I've strategically picked the guys that are going to be my leaders in the next few years. They're the guys that I pour my life into. Okay? And I ask the hard question to them. And to the point of uh, about four, five months ago, I said to one of the young guys, <clears throat> I said, so what are you going to do in the church? We've never joined a church before. I said, well, when are you going to? Next time you have a class, I guess. And it was that, just that question that pushed him into, yeah. I need to be a part of this deal. Okay, but, but I couldn't have done that had I walked up to the middle of the church, whatever. It had to be the relationship. And so um, I have guys that I do that with. So and, and I do lunch with them. And they are, they come off of work. I give them an hour. I'm ready for, I'm waiting on them. I do my best to wait on them. They show up. We eat a sandwich, whatever. I talk to them. They go back to work. Okay. And right now I think I'm the five or six of those, those guys. All right, so the pastors, two groups of those. How often is that? Uh, that's on a six-week rotation, too, so I can keep everything on the six-week. Uh, but <clears throat> I get off because uh, if one of these guys is, has a business trip or the kids are sick that day and he calls, I can make it. Then I just move it one week down. I don't try to, uh, I've got to the spot where I was, first one I was doing, I was trying to say, well, I'll meet you next week. 
Then I said, I have to kill myself. So I just moved in six weeks, and we just moved this time. It misses that time period. And so I think some of them, if they like it well enough, they're mm -hmm. starting to pick up the It really needs to be <laughs> urgent for me to miss that meeting. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Okay? Um, okay. Here's the, the first question on the next group. You can have a set of questions that you can work from. <clears throat> I have, if I wanted to, I have a, a with Hispanics I talked about, you know, uh, Wesley has his set of groups, his set of questions he has this, his class groups. And uh, then I have a set that I made up of, of 12 questions. I used several men's ministry things and I created a sheet of paper and I have 12 questions on that that I can ask if I need to. Uh, you do whatever you're familiar with and uh, just I would come in with questions. You can do a book with the pastors. Um, usually I have the book that I'm reading. I usually have one in my car that I pull, I pull along with me. We talk about that. We talk about what's going on. How's it going? Our last conversation, last two conversations with Darren's group, we've been talking about uh, two services. How does that, what does that look like? Why are you doing it? Um, we've been talking about that in the kind of conversation so they get the flavor of those of us. You know, we've gone to two services, they go back to one. And now we're dialoguing again now. What are we going to do? I'm going to have to go back to services again. Uh, so, and Darren's kind of that same, same thing. So. Okay, so you can you can do a book. Um, you can do the questions. Um, you can come with a recent book. Or you can come with a set book that you have with the, with the men in the church. I have a set book that I'm doing. And it's John Helfrich's book. I'm, I'm talking with God. It's the red book. <clears throat> it has a workbook in it. And uh, now I know her. We've been in that book for a year and a half. It will be in another year and a half. <clears throat> I write up three questions, put it on a piece of paper, put it on a planner. We go to the meeting, pull up, we talk, how's life, how's marriage, how's the church, how's the emotions. Oh, okay, okay, here's my three questions. <clears throat> when I do three questions, they all, they don't know really do it. They take their table, their, their uh, plate, and they push it to the middle of the table. And they kind of like breaks up. Okay, now I'm ready to go. <laughs> and so I ask the three questions. And so, you know, and those are pretty sometimes. Uh, one of them is two of them are fairly so so, and then use those ones to the point. Okay? And do that. So, we do, so the last six here, here, here are those. Here, those. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The last one. You can talk about their issues. Okay? The next one on that is listen. Um, and as pastors, I think that we're terrible at this. Um, and let me illustrate that to you. How many times have you been in a conversation? <clears throat> I do it. Uh, I watch others do it. How many times have you been in a conversation that somebody was having a conversation, they were talking, and you, you butted into the conversation? Okay? Because we think that what we're going to say is more important than what's going on here. We are terrible at listening. And so we have to work hard at listening when, when we're around these tables and with the guys. Um, I think it's important to listen to what they're saying and it's important to listen to what they're not saying. I watch them. Uh, my, you know, if a guy gets defensive on me, you know, what, what do most people do when they get defensive? If it's body language, what do they do? Yeah. Cross their arms. Right. Cross their arms, cross their legs. They turn. You, you know, counts when you're counseling. And they turn on you, you know, let's call it a night and go home because you're not going to hear anything. When they turn that shoulder to you, you know, it's over. So you can watch for that kind of stuff and you can pay attention and hopefully they will. Number three on that group on that list is share. Um, the longevity of Dustin's and I relation this relationship. I think allows us to be honest and open. <clears throat> we may preface it with that with a statement to say, okay, now I'm just going to really tell you what I think. But for the most part, we're not really good at sharing because we have this image that we think people ought to see in us. And so even with the pastors, if we're not careful, we start we have this image, this hierarchy that we want people to understand, you know, I pass the church bigger than yours. When the reality is we all have our issues, we all have our weaknesses, we all have our strengths. And if we could share life together, we'd be so much better off. It's one of the reasons why small groups work so well. Sunday school works so well when you have a good set working Sunday school. 
because we're sharing life together. And so, if we can drop our facades and let it go, you know what the word, the word hypocrite uh, that we use in the New Testament comes out of the Roman era where they were doing the plays. And, um, you know, a hypocrite was an actor who had the mask on a stick and had another mask on a stick. And he would do the play and he would do the two parts. He would hold up the mask here and do the part. And he would totally hold up the other mask and do the other part. He was that known as, that was known as a hypocrite. A person who could do the play and be two different people. If we're not careful, we find ourselves being hypocrites. We say this, but it's not really who we are. Okay. Well, Phil, I think, too, you made a comment just a moment ago, and, and I think with what I've experienced in my life personally and, and in the lives of other people, the larger you become, I think, the more vulnerable you feel in the sense of allowing yourself to be transparent, even to other pastors, because the risks are higher. In our minds, the risk is higher, because we don't want anyone to see that we may not be having a such a good day or such a good time um, and so there's this facade when in all actuality we need to talk to somebody yeah. you know no i told you from work you know when, when we had our train wreck and everything that i thought was incredible just in a matter of months was just dashed you know i i, I, I everything that i thought where i was was questioned and it was a tough time. Uh, so talking with people was a very tough deal. And I, I totally agree with you. All right, number, one, uh, number four is be positive. Be positive. Uh, and the reason I just said this is when you're going to be, especially with, um, now your lay people may be having a good day, and, and this won't be such a crucial, but you may have your, your the guys in your past you're working with and your pastors, they may be coming in and they may have absolutely been beat to death <coughs> that week. And so try try to be uplifting. Uh, listen to stuff coming into that that sets you up. And so you're ready to go. Give them some energy. Give them some time. Give them your best. Be positive. Encourage them. Say, you can do this. Uh, we've got a, one guy in one of our groups at Darren's group. Um, I mean, the sun is always going down. Good. <laughs> 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 And I think the world's getting ready to blow up yeah. at times. And so you really have to work hard at that, okay? Be positive. The next one is don't condemn. Um, I work hard at trying not to condemn them in any way. And the last one is be honest. Be honest. Um, Welch, who was the CEO of uh, the GE, talked about in his company that they that the issue of not having candor in his business cost him billions of dollars because they would do projects that people in the boardroom or people in the project room said yeah that, that, let's go for that that'll work when in reality they all knew it wasn't going to work and so they come to meetings halfway through the project get started and they would say well you know i kind of thought from the first this wasn't going to work but you know, I just kind of want to go with it because that's what you wanted to do. And uh, Welsh, you know, I think he's a Christian now, but back then he wasn't a Christian, so he was explaining this in very descriptive terms. And uh, I can see him doing it in, in a board seating, meeting setting when he just laid somebody low and said, if you would speak truth in this board meeting, we could have saved billions of dollars and our stock would be higher than it is now. Like, well, wait, wait, wait. And so he's telling that story with Bill Hybels, and I'm thinking, you know, in the church, we, don't, we, we sit in our board meetings, and people give us the yes answers. And then it causes us problems, and maybe costs souls. And so have candor in your group, be honest, and uh, be truthful, and let, let it kind of flow through uh, your life. So that's what we've been doing. That's kind of the story of our lives in the last uh, little bit with this whole issue of mentorship. It really did all start with the pastor uh, who loved the Lord did his, did his best. Okay? Any questions on it, guys? Appreciate your investment. Uh, my life. Yeah. Yeah.